This morning we talked about um, Jewish identity. We talked about Jews living as a minority in the diaspora, Zionism's origins, took it through World War I, through the evolution of the young nation Arab states to the Palestine Mandate, uh, made some remarks about the geopolitical importance of the region to great powers, why the Balfour Declaration and why the Jewish National Home idea fit within British imperial or colonial interests at the time, and how the Zionists were perfectly willing to have a patron to help act as a uh, uh, catalyst to help them develop national home. This quotation which you see up here is from the British High Commissioner. The, the High Commissioner in Palestine was the highest British official. And the first High Commissioner was Sir Herbert Samuel. He, he was the, the, the uh, administrative uh, uh, director in charge of Palestine from 1920 to 25. The High Commissioner of Palestine had absolute legislative, judicial, and legal authority. Whatever he decided, that was what policy was in Palestine. He reported to the British Colonial Office, uh, and the Colonial Office, along with the High Commissioner, made policy about how the British would behave. And this is a perfect example of how the British viewed their presence. There's a tendency here to regard the government as sort of an umpire and scorer, trying to hold a balance between the two races, noting when one scores off the other and regarding it as only fair that the next point in the game should be scored by the race that lost the preceding one. That was pretty much British attitude. Let's let the two communities grow apart, not necessarily stimulate their community, their communal organization or collaboration. They want to control their own religious affairs. They want to control their own economic affairs. They want to control their own political affairs. The Arab community does not want to participate in the politics of the mandate because they think our presence here is inappropriate and incorrect, unlawful, illegal, whatever term you want to use. And the Zionists said, that's fine with us. We'll continue to evolve our own institutions, um, economic institutions, political institutions, social institutions, and even self-defense organizations. And so what you have evolving in Palestine is the British as an umbrella, and the two communities are under the umbrella, developing and evolving separately, developing at a different pace, with different numbers, with different priorities, and that's how Palestine evolves in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. It evolves as two separate communities who have some minimal amount of interaction economically, almost no interaction politically except when it comes to violence, and the Jewish community is interested in increasing its size, and the Arab community is interested in keeping the Jewish community as small as possible. And you have periodic violence that takes place in Palestine. You have violence in 21, you have violence in 22, and violence in 28, 29, 33, 36, 36 to 39. And the violence is an expression of Palestinian Arab frustration that they cannot either have their leadership do what's necessary, or their economic condition is so bad, or they want to see the Jewish national home come to a screeching halt. And the violence is not systematic, it's sporadic, sometimes it's organized, rarely, but most of the time, the violence that the Arabs are incurring against the Jewish institutions and against the British institutions essentially bring more harm to them and their own economy than it does to the Jewish institutions or to the British. Essentially, the violence that breaks out in Palestine between 36 and 39, known as uh, the Mered or the Moraot, this violence is pretty continuous. It's the one that's the most continuous between 36 and 39, and that has a devastating effect upon the Palestinian rural economy. And the Palestinian rural economy that's already eking along, that's barely squeaking by, is having a real difficult time after 1939 to support the population that's increasingly going. If the Arab population of Palestine was majority rural and living in rural areas of Palestine in during World War I. After World War I, they continued to do so, and the, the, the population may become increasingly indebted. 
And what you find is, as the indebtedness may occur, individuals may turn over title deeds, title deeds may find their way into landlords, landowners or merchants or, or urban officials may find it much better and easier for them to rid themselves of a title deed than continue to have people work land where there's not remuneration coming back to them into their pocket. It's a good reason, it's a good motivation for people, therefore, to say to an incoming uh, individual, to another Arab or to a, a, a Jewish buyer, sure, you can, you can, you can buy my, my land, but I'm going to charge you a hell of a lot for it. And so this is part of the socioeconomic dynamic which is going on in Palestine. Not all of the land that the Jews purchase will be purchased from resident Arabs. Some of them will be from Arabs who have who have been living in, in Beirut or Alexandria or in Cairo. But by the end of the 19, by the end of 1930 or 31, the majority of land that Jews will purchase from 30 to 31 to the end of the mandate comes from Palestinian Arabs themselves, and a lot of it comes from small owners. How do we know that? Because we've looked at the Jewish National Fund documents, we've looked at the Palestine legis Palestine uh, registers. And we know that what happened was that individuals were slowly alienating their land. They were slowly leaving their lands. And they were ultimately going to work um, and to find alternative labor, sometimes in British areas, in British facilities. They might be working in public works and building roads. They might work in, uh, in, in building Haifa port. Uh, they might work in building the pipeline that goes from Mosul to, to Haifa. In other words, the British presence provided alternative occupation and income to many of those who were living on lands and no longer could eke out a sub sub subsistence existence on the land. And the British provided the alternative. And after 1945, when the British begin to draw down their presence and they draw down their economic investment in Palestine, Palestinian Arabs who've been working for the British increasingly become unemployed. That's a social economic dynamic of what happens in, in, in a measure to the Palestinian Arab community. It's not all of it, it's some of it. I don't mean to stand here and tell you that in the last 10 minutes, I've been able to give you the entire history of the social economic and history of the Palestinian Arab peasantry from 1920 through 1948. That's, that would be the, 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 the high point of, 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 of historical inaccuracy for me to do so but it's a glimpse. The Jewish community seek their own self-sufficiency. They develop their own organizations to satisfy their own needs. They create bank, a bank, the Anglo-Palestine Bank. They create a labor union. They create organizations that are essentially from, from uh, womb to tomb in terms of the needs of the community. Political parties. Uh, they uh, create institutions that are supposed to help absorb more immigrants. Uh, they develop a Hebrew cultural and community cement. And so the two communities are evolving separately. Institutions are evolving at different rates. Um, and the Arab society in Palestine, the, as I said to you this morning, land becomes the contested area of control. Uh, Arab, Arab politics in Palestine, primarily in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, is fragmented very much like it had been before uh, the British came. It was fragmented um, and divided uh, by uh, villages, by communities, by village structures uh, during the late Ottoman period. Um, and the Zionists were fueled by an Arab inconsistency uh, to participate in the mandate. The British wanted sometimes the, the Arabs to participate, and most of the time the Arab community said, no, thank you, we don't want to, because if we do, we ha we're recognizing the Jewish national home. And we don't want to recognize the Jewish national home. At the very same time, you had some Arab living in Palestine who actively colluded with the Zionists. And there are books written about it. There's a book written by Hillel Cohen uh, um, um, uh, called Army of Shadows, published by Berkeley, uh, 2009 and 2010, which gives you all of the different areas of Arab collusion uh, in participation of helping the Zionists create a national home. Not to the point that if it, you could say that if it hadn't been for the Arab collusion, you wouldn't have had a, a, a Jewish national home or a Jewish state, but it adds a measure of fuel 
to the Zionist realization that they can continue to grow and develop because Arab sincerity in terms of commitment to Palestinian Arab nationalism is not as strong and is not as vigorous as one would have expected it to be. And a clear example of how we know that, because if we read the Palestinian Arab press from the 1930s, from the early 1930s, we read their editorials. And if the editorials in the Hebrew press, and the, Hebrew, the editorials in the Arabic press are, are available, they're available at, at the National Archives in Washington, they're available at the Hebrew University Ar Library, they're available at, in, at, at, the, at university libraries in Beirut. And if you read the Arabic, what you come to the conclusion is that Arabs themselves understood that Palestine was slipping through their hands. And they wrote about it in the early 30s. I'm not talking about 35 or 39 or 42. I'm talking about the early 30s. I mean, it, it's far different than what we know today about or the, or the kind of history that's told about the mandate, as if the man, about the mandate ended in 1948, simply because the international community was desirous of giving a gift to the Jews because of the Holocaust and the tragedy that had befallen the Jews. That's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. But sometimes nonsense becomes a meta-truth, and a meta-truth becomes a history. And if you take a look at the history of Palestine from the 20s through the end of the 40s, it's a very different history in terms of what happens actually by looking at the sources as compared to what is written in books. And a lot of times what is written in books is historians want to write how they want it to end up and the terminology that they want to use and the things that they exclude in telling the story. And that's the reality. And I can't change the reality. I can't change the reality in the manner in which Zionists compensated Palestinian Arabs to leave lands that they purchased from landowners. And we have, British, we have Jewish officials who stand up and say, this is not right. We shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be taking advantage of the impoverished Palestinian Arab population. And if the leadership had clamped down and had said to those who are participating in land sales, maybe it would have been different. But it wasn't different. And just because I want it to be different or someone wants it to be different, I can't write a history saying it is different. I can only give you the evidence and you have to come to the conclusion. Zionists succeed because they had a diasporic experience that they brought with them to Palestine. We talked about that this morning. They had leaders in rank and file that are driven, perseverance, pragmatic, create facts when opportunity permits. They lobby to make their case. Sometimes they were successful and sometimes they weren't. But they were certainly successful at the UN from preventing the UN from reaffirming a British trusteeship in 1945. Because had a British trusteeship been reaffirmed in 1945, the idea of going to the UN at some point and seeking a vote to have two states or have an independent state would not have been possible. Want to read about it? Read Eliyahu A. Lot's book, Zionism at the UN. Tells you the whole story of what they did at Lake Success. International legitimacy is what they seek. The UN, UN partition, UN acceptance, eventually the peace treaty in 79, the Jordanian-Israeli treaty in 94, and the Arab opposition. And if you want to find out how Arab historians write about what happened to the Palestinian Arabs between 1947 and 1949, I'm going to ask you to go to the Center for Israel Education website www.israeled.org and I'm going to ask you to look under themes and under themes I'm going to ask you to go to 1948 war and under 1948 war I'm going to ask you to take a look on the right hand side of the theme page and you will find a series of art, series of quotations paragraphs written by Palestinian Arabs about why they did not succeed in 47 48 and 49 
And I'll ask you to read the article written by Yigal Alon, who was a young soldier fighting first for the Palmach and then for the Haganah. And he writes this article in Hebrew. And the article we translated, in, the article was written in 1952, and the article is, Why Did We Win? And it's a very clear analysis on why the Zionists succeeded in 1948-49. In 37, the British decided that maybe Jews and Arabs couldn't live together. So after 17 years, they decided to partition Palestine, maybe to create two states. And maybe there would be a transfer of Arab population out of the Jewish state. Some of the concepts and ideas that we know today that are part of the diplomatic process, population transfer, land swaps, internationalization of Jerusalem, many of these ideas are first articulated and first presented in the Peel Commission report of 1937. Sometimes diplomatic solutions are not just invented because of what happened yesterday. Sometimes you can find a precedent for them 10, 15, 25, 35, 55, 75 years ago. An economic union was suggested for the two states, with Jerusalem as a special sector under British control. That very same phrase ends up in the partition plan of 1947. A little modification. But there was supposed to be an economic union, supposed to be two states with a special place for Jerusalem. Britain's rule from 22 to 39, let Palestine pay for itself. Let the Jews who come to Palestine, if they want to come to Palestine, let's make them pay to immigrate. Let's tax their, their, um, their, their, their economy. Let's use the economic um, tax revenue that we get from the Jewish population developing its economy. Let's use it ourselves to sustain our British presence. Take a look at British um, uh, um, budgets from 1929 or 1927 or 1935 or 1939, and what you find is the British spent money on developing their strategic presence. They, built, they spent money on ports, on telegraph, on roads. They did not spend a lot of money on educating the Arab population. They didn't spend any money at all on educating the Jewish population. They spent very little money in giving loans to impoverished Arabs. The British were there to protect the strategic national interest. They weren't there to help the indigenous population. They let the indigenous populations essentially evolve themselves, take care of their own. Autonomy was exactly what the Zionists wanted. They didn't want anyone interfering in their ability to develop a national home over time. In 1939, here you have Charette, Weizmann, and Ben-Gurion in March of 39 at the Zionist Congress. These three guys know. They know what's about to happen in Germany. They've heard stories about Hitler. They know stories about people who come from Germany. They know that this is a, an individual whose intention is to, is, is to, is, is to make anti-Semitism a calculated goal, a calculated objective of the state. And they also know that in Palestine in 39, they're facing the British who are going to say, let's slow down the Jewish national home. Violence in Palestine is not of our interest. We don't want to put British gendarmes and the British military in controlling the population here in Palestine. It's too costly. Besides which, Arab leaders in surrounding Arab states don't like it. They don't like the fact that we're continuing to allow the Jews to develop a national home. And so they slow it down. They pass the 1939 White Paper, which puts limitations on Jewish immigration, puts limitations on Jewish land purchase, and also has uh, uh, promises that there will be a federal state in 10 years with a majority Arab population. This is the world Jewish population, the geographic distribution in millions. And what you see in 1914 is the Palestine population, the Jewish population was 60,000. In 1939 was 420,000. In 1948 was 660,000. Now, 
What happens is that the Jewish population increases tenfold between 14 and 48. And that's primarily because of immigration. This, by the way, is all in the PowerPoint, which is accessible to you online. If you want to take a picture of it, please do so. And here are very specific items that I would recommend to you. It's in the PowerPoint that I would recommend you to read because these are clear evidence, and particularly the Arab leaders meeting in Damascus in 1938, of coming together and saying, Palestine is about to be lost. If the Arab states don't recognize what's going on in Palestine, we are doomed to lose Palestine. Jews don't just say, they do, is the comment that made by one of the leading Arab officials who meets in Damascus. In 1939, the Mufti, the Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al Husseini, is offered by the British the creation of a federal state in 10 years. He brings together all of his advisors, they gather together outside of Beirut, and they meet for two or three days, and the debate is, should they or should they not accept the federal solution? And 14 of the 15 who are there say, yes, Haj Amin, yes, let's accept it. And Haj Amin says, no, I want nothing to do with the Zionists here at all, and he rejects it. And this is a diary entry by Izzet Tanous uh, of, of the Mufti rejecting the federal solution in 39. In 1947, Abba Iban, David Horowitz, and, and another Zionist official meet with Azam Pasha, who is the Arab League Secretary General. In September of 1947, they meet in a London hotel, and the Zionists come to the Arab League representative and say, let's have a two-state solution. Let's not go to war. And Azam Pasha, when you read the diary entry, Azam Pasha says, we won't win anything by compromise. Nations only succeed in war. We may lose Palestine. It's highly likely. It's possible. But we're not in a compromising mood. Now the question you have to ask yourself, if individuals are given opportunity and they enter an intersection and the, and the light is about to turn yellow, and they put on the gas, and they decide that they're going to go through the intersection, two things can happen, maybe three. One, they could get hit by a car if they go through the intersection. Second, they may decide to put on the foot on the gas, slam on the brakes, and not go through the intersection. Maybe they decide to go through the intersection, and a car behind them starts whirring with the, with the little blue top. Supposing you get hit by a car going through the intersection. Who's responsible for putting your foot on the gas? Who's responsible for rejecting a federal solution in 1939? There's no guarantee there would have been an Arab state in 1949. Who's responsible for rejecting the idea of compromise in 1947? Now you can stand there, you can sit there and say, oh, the Zionists were insincere, they really didn't mean it. Fine. If you don't want to believe the source material, that's your prerogative. But if the entire period of time during the mandate from 1920 through 1948, you've rejected any kind of compromise because you want no Zionist presence at all, where's the responsibility lie? My argument is, if people make decisions, they're held accountable. But if you don't make decisions, you're also held accountable. And you can't run away from accountability. Even if you want to start history different than history starting in the 1920s or the 1880s or the 1860s when land sales, land deeds are, 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 are introduced in, in the entire Middle East, which changed the sociological complexion of the region. My argument is leaders have got to be held accountable. People who participate in collusion have got to be held accountable. Zionists have got to be held accountable if they were responsible for making, making Arabs leave Palestine during the 47-49 war. Isn't just one side or the other is held accountable? But you can't tell a history that's just the history of one side. 
You have, you can, that's a narrative. You've heard me say this before. You're getting tired of me saying it. History is blending them together. That's what this is about. How are we doing on time, Eli? So the British want to try and slow down the Jewish national home. They're not really successful at it. Jews resort to attacking the British and the Arabs to try and hasten British departure. Land acquisitions continue. Infrastructure for the Jewish state continues. The white paper of 1939 is itself recognition that the two populations are living apart and probably won't be blended together. From 45 to 49, the Arab League established, takes control of the Palestinian issue. There's emotional commitment now to see a Jewish state established because of what we know of what happened between 39 and 45. You can't divorce the results of 39 to 45 from the establishment of Israel. But my entire argument today has been that there was an independent history that was evolving in Palestine that had nothing to do with what Hitler was doing in Europe. And if all one teaches is victimization in the Holocaust and say that Israel came about because there was a miracle, you're not telling the truth. You're telling a myth. Now, it may be a preferred myth. And no one's trying to diminish the importance of the Holocaust in Jewish history or Jewish identity. I'm merely saying in terms of what evolved in Palestine. First major Arab flight occurs after the partition resolution of, 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 of November uh, 1947, the idea to create an Arab state, a Jewish state, an internationalization of Jerusalem, and an economic union. And then there is Arab flight. And then there is a second Arab flight that occurs because of Deir Yassin, an, uh, an Arab village uh, outside of Jerusalem is attacked and 200 plus men, women, and children are killed. Now people have argued about was it 200 or was it 100 or was it 150 or was it 170. The fact of the matter is the impact of Deir Yassin was enormous upon the local Arab population. It caused many people just to be scared and get the hell out. And that should not be understated by how many people were or were not killed. You have the State of Israel declared in 48. Armistice agreements, not treaties, are signed. UN Resolution 194, that should be December 1948, not 1949. That's a mistake on my part. Compensation and return are suggested for refugees if they're willing to live in peace with their neighbors. Israel doubles its population between 48 and 53 as more than 800,000 Jews from Arab lands settle in the state of Israel. And I don't think any Zionist leader in 1945 remotely even believed that the population of, of Israel would increase by 800,000 after the state of Israel was created. It, it was just, I, I've never seen a book or a document that said that somehow the Zionists believed that Jews in Arab lands would be expelled because of Zionism, and they would end up coming to Eretz Israel or the new state of Israel. So here's a comparison, and I'll finish with these. Here's a comparison of 47. This is what the armist, this is what the partition plan looked like, and this is what the eventual end product was of the 49 war. And what you see is, you see the white area that was to be the Jewish state is much larger in 49 than it was in 47. And you see the Arab area, the West Bank and Gaza, are the only things that are left, the Gaza Strip to Egypt, and the, the area that becomes known as the West Bank is left to Jordan. Put in numerical terms, when Israel's independence war ended in 49, the area held by Israel was 20,500 square kilometers, an increase of 37% of what the UN had allocated, and a 50% decrease of what was to be the Arab state. The decision by Arab states not to accept partition of 47, consequences of action, and to go to war resulted in land lost and Arab flight. 
1950, Jordan annexed the West Bank and Egypt controlled the Gaza Strip. No Arab state was created as a result of the 47 to 49 conflict or a result of the Palestinian partition plan. Now numerically, the state of Israel benefits from the partition plan and from going to war in terms of size. We'll take questions after we go through the socioeconomic um, documentation. Thank you for allowing me to run through it so quickly. Thank you for your attention. Of course, I'll be around to answer questions.